Ready? <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and welcome again to Wave of Hope. Here at Canaveral Port Ministry, it's always good to be able to chat with you. And we hope you're doing well and uh, still a difficult time, but we are not going to give up and our love and prayers are always with you. And before, uh, before Wendy shares her beautiful voice again, I want to share a, a verse that has, has stuck with me and this comes from Matthew 28 verse 19. And I had it. There it is. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what this ministry is for. That's what we're trying to do. And I know that's what some of you are out there around the world doing, is spreading the word of God, encouraging each other. And that's that's what's... That's what just part, but that is what faith is, is sharing and helping others. And that's what we all the staff and the volunteers here are praying for you and trying to share with you and you share with others and anything that you need. If you need help, just encouragement or what, please let us know and email us here at the port www.cpm life l i f e we would love to hear from you and i know we keep in contact with some and it's so good to be able to talk to you and that day is coming when we will be shaking hands and being able to hug saying hi but stay encouraged be blessed we are with you god is with you his love is with you and our love and prayers are with you so before Wendy sings and Steve uh, gives a message, let's have let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. It's and as your word says, go among nations and, and preach the word. And Lord, to be able to lit, literally do that here at this ministry and our seafarers, brother and sisters, and people around the world that listen and watch and that we know they're doing the same thing we are praying for you to touch this world with your peace with the, your healing from this covid and and praying for the seafarers that they would be able to get back to work we want pray first that they get back to work but the second prayer is they they come back here and we see our our family again yeah, we just thank you so much. We pray for your blessings on this, on this moment of worship, and bless Win, Wendy's voice as she sings uh, another beautiful song, and just bless the words that Steve will share in just a moment. We thank you, Lord, and it's your most loving and merciful name. We pray, Amen. Sing with me. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. 
Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Hello, welcome to the Canaveral Port Ministry Ways of Hope Chapel. I am Chaplain Steve McCrory, and it's my privilege today to lead us in an examination of Joshua chapter 8, verses 1 through 29. As I mention every week, when we study scripture, it's good to know the context, or at least a little bit, of what's going on before, during, and after what we're studying. As we pick up from last week, we continue our march through the Bible as we examine the book of Joshua. My last presentation was Joshua chapter 2 and talking about Rahab and what a marvelous story that was. Since then, um, we've crossed chapter 3, the Israelites finally crossed the Jordan, that's a real exciting chapter. Then in chapter 4, the Israelites place memorials to the Jordan crossing. In chapter 5, re Israel reestablishes covenant ceremonies and the Lord's commander confronts Joshua and that is just like crazy awesome. Then in chapter 7, revealed the defeat the Israelites incurred at A.E. and Achan's sin. And that leads us up to today's presentation of Joshua 8, 1 through 29. But as I typically do, let's peek forward just a bit. In the second half of chapter 8, the Lord's covenant is renewed. And then in chapter 9, the Gibeonites deceive Israel to save themselves. Seems like the cat's out of the bag when it comes to the surrounding tribes and such being just terrified of the Israelites. So back to today's passage, Joshua chapter 8, verses 1 through 29. I'm going to read this. As I typically do, I read out of the New Living Translation. Again, I do this because so many people who might be listening to this, will their English is, is perhaps their second or third, maybe even fourth language. So I'd like to try to present it in a way that's maybe the easiest to sort of digest. So what we read here is um, chapter 8, the Israelites will defeat A.E., I know it's easy to say that I, like A-I, but I believe the correct pronunciation is A-E. So I begin with verse 1. Then the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid or discouraged. Take all your fighting men and attack A-E, for I have given you the king of A-E, his people, his town, and his land. You will destroy them as you destroy Jericho and its king. But this time you may keep the plunder and the livestock for yourselves set an ambush behind the town. So Joshua and all the fighting men set out to attack A.E. Joshua chose 30,000 of his best warriors and sent them out at night with these orders. Hide an ambush close behind the town and be ready for action. When our main army attacks, the men of A.E. will come out to fight as they did before, and we will run away from them. We will let them chase us until we have drawn them away from the town, for they will say the Israelites are running away from us as they did before. Then, while we are running from them, you will jump up from your ambush and take possession of the town, for the Lord your God will give it to you. Set the town on fire as the Lord has commanded. You have your orders. So they left and went to the place of ambush between Bethel and the west side of A.E. But Joshua remained among the people in the camp that night. Early the next morning, Joshua roused his men and started towards A.E., accompanied by the elders of Israel. All the fighting men who were with Joshua marched in front of the town and camped on the north side of A.E., with a valley between them and the town. That night, Joshua sent about 5,000 men to lie in ambush between Bethel and Ai on the west side of the town. So they stationed the main army north of the town and the ambush west of the town. Joshua himself spent that night in the valley. When the king of Ai saw the Israelites across the valley, he and all his army hurried out in the morning and attacked the Israelites at a place overlooking the Jordan Valley but he didn't realize there was an ambush behind the town. Joshua and the Israelite army fled towards the wilderness as though they were badly beaten. 
Then all the men in the town were called out to chase after them. In this way, they were lured away from the town. There was not a man left in Ai or Bethel who did not chase after the Israelites, and the town was left wide open. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Point the spear in your hand towards Ai, for I will hand the town over to you. Joshua did as he was commanded. As soon as Joshua gave the signal, all the men in ambush jumped up from their position and poured into the town. They quickly captured it and set it on fire. When the men of Ai looked behind them, smoke from the town was filling the sky and they had nowhere to go. For the Israelites who had fled in the direction of the wilderness now turned on their pursuers. When Joshua and all the other Israelites saw that the ambush had succeeded and that smoke was rising from the town, they turned and attacked the men of Ai. Meanwhile, the Israelites who were inside the town came out and attacked the enemy from the rear. So the men from Ai were caught in the middle with Israelite fighters on both sides. Israel attacked them and not a single person survived or escaped. Only the king of Ai was taken alive and brought to Joshua. When the Israelite army finished chasing and killing all the men of Ai in the open fields, they went back and finished off everyone inside. So the entire population of Ai, including men and women, was wiped out that day. 12,000 in all. For Joshua kept holding out his spear until everyone who had lived in Ai was completely destroyed. Only the livestock and the treasures of the town were not destroyed, for the Israelites kept these as plunder for themselves, as the Lord had commanded Joshua. So Joshua burned the town of Ai, and it became a permanent mound of ruins, desolate to this very day. Joshua impaled the king of Ai on a sharpened pole and left him there until evening. At sunset, the Israelites took down the body as Joshua commanded and threw it in front of the town gate. They piled a great heap of stones over him that can still be seen today. And that concludes the passage. In review, what we're seeing here in Joshua 8 is a victory over Ai. In verses 1 and 2, God encourages Joshua and gives him instructions, plans for victory. Do not be afraid or discouraged. This was the first key to regaining victory. They had to receive encouragement from God. Though Israel stumbled through Achan's sin, as showed in Joshua 7, they dealt with the failure and now had to move on. It is often difficult to regain lost ground, such as A.E. When we have failed at some point in our Christian lives, we need to know how to get back on track. What is past is past. We must deal with it before God in repentance and turning from self and then look forward to what he has for us right now. God wants to use our failures in a good way, to use them as a foundation for great victory in the Lord. Now is the time to get busy and set about being victorious for the Lord because he had not abandoned them. And now God allows them to keep the spoil from the city of Ai. How foolish the sin of Achan seems now. He could have had all his heart desired if he only waited on the Lord for it. It's a wise lesson for us to remember. God gives Joshua a plan for conquering the city of Ai, and he must follow it. When we need to regain victory, we must also follow God's plan. As we move into verses 3 through 8, plans are unfolding for an ambush on Ai. This time, Joshua did not send 3,000 men as, as he did before back in Joshua 7. Now he sent 30,000 of his best warriors. Often, when we need to regain victory, we must also use every resource and the best resources available to us for victory. God had given Joshua the general plan, and he left it up to Joshua's experience and common sense to lay out the specific plan of battle. Proceeding into verses 9 and 10, Joshua stays with his people. Joshua was especially near his people during this crucial time of trying to regain victory. The people needed to know he was near, and they needed to follow his leadership. Well, kind of like Joshua was to the Israelites, if we will regain victory, 
we must live with and follow Jesus. Never forget that Jesus is always near to us in our Christian life. In verses 11 through 13, we see the preparations for battle. Joshua and the people do exactly what the Lord commanded them. If Israel will regain victory, they must take the offensive. They don't wait for A.E. to bring the battle to them. They bring the battle to A.E. We often see the battle against sin is mainly in negative terms about what not to do. But we are wise to take the offensive against the powers of darkness and temptation and be busy about doing what the Lord would have us do. Moving forward in verses 14 through 17, uh, that shows us that the ambush works and the fighting man of A.E. take the bait and leave the city. The men of A.E. tried the exact same strategy against Israel as before. It's important to note here that generally Satan will stick with a strategy against us until it doesn't work anymore. God directed Joshua to use a completely different strategy against A.E., and in it, we see the diversity of God's methods. Then in verses 18, 18 through 29, big section, A.E. is totally defeated and burnt to the ground. The victory and God's judgment is complete. Because of God's faithfulness to Israel and Israel's faithfulness to God, this is not a halfway victory. If Israel will gain victory, they must show no mercy to their enemy but crush the enemy completely at every opportunity. We can summarize the keys for this victory from this chapter in, in just like a handful of things. For example, be encouraged. <clears throat> Excuse me. Follow the Lord's plan. Use every resource and the best resources. Live with and look to Jesus as the Israelites did with Joshua. Go on the offensive and show no mercy to the enemy. So far, Israel's experience is an illustration of their whole history and the spiritual history of many Christians. For example, obedience followed by victory, victory followed by blessing, blessing followed by pride and disobedience, disobedience followed by defeat, defeat followed by judgment, Judgment followed by repentance, repentance followed by obedience, and obedience followed by victory. And we see this cycle over and over and over as we, as we march through the Bible. In reflection, when the people had dealt with the sin of Achan as God commanded, Israel was ready to engage the enemy again. In view of Israel's recent defeat, God's encouraging words were necessary to strengthen Joshua's resolve. God promised to give victory, but he specified the strategy. Evidently, all the fighting men from Bethel, A.E.'s neighbor, joined with all the soldiers of A.E. to repulse Israel's attack. These two cities apparently had made a treaty for mutual defense. The text does not record Bethel's defeat, although its king is listed among those conquered by Joshua later in chapter 12, verse 16. It may be that in defense, in the defeat of A.E., Bethel was also defeated and no further reference was needed. Stretching out his spear was Joshua's prearranged signal to his men in ambush to attack. It also symbolized, like Moses' upraised staff, that victory came from the Lord. Joshua carefully obeyed all the Lord's directions, both those given here and previously in the law. Furthermore, he erected a pile, a great heap of stones, as a monument at the former gate of the city. This passage shows that God gives victory when his people acknowledge their dependence on him by trusting him and obeying his word. It's interesting to note, again, that this first victory in the hill country was in the region of A.E. and Bethel, exactly where some of the most significant promises had been given to Abraham and Jacob hundreds of years earlier. In addition to the strategic nature of the region, these earlier promises may have played a part in the decision to begin this campaign precisely there. Joshua's bold move 
towards this part of the hill country may have been just what was needed to unify the enemy, to unify the Canaanites in the Bethel region. Up to this point, they appear to have been in disarray in the face of the Israelite threat. Remember, everyone was terrorized. What better place for them to make their stand than here at the entrance to the strategic region of Bethel? In closing, it's clear that Israel's occupation of the promised land was not a sure thing, but continued to depend entirely on her trust and obedience to God. As example for Israel, defeat in the land need not be final and re irreversible. The defeats we face, likewise, need not be final and irreversible. For Israel to regain the land, the people had to deal with or administer justice to the guilty law violators in Israel, and they had to return to obeying the Lord. In similarity for us, we need to deal with our guilt by confessing it to the Lord and turn from our wrongful ways and return to obedience to the Lord. It is so important and I, I've said this before, it's so important to remember in this book of Joshua that God did not destroy a people that had not heard about him. He gave those people, as he does for us, much, much opportunity, more than ample opportunity to turn to him. We are offered the same promise of victory. Our victory of salvation comes to us as a free gift that only need to be received in faith by grace. We are all guilty of having done, thought, or said bad things, which the Bible calls sin. The Bible says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The Bible tells us in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The result or the consequence of sin is death, defeat, and spiritual separation from God. But God loves us. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place for our sins. Jesus died in our place so we could have an everlasting relationship and be with him forever. Through Christ alone, our victory rests. The Bible tells us in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. The cost of our salvation has already been paid in the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross. The Bible tells us in John 1.12, But to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. Will we be counted as God's children? We can be. But it's, us up, it's up to us to make a stand, to decide. It's up to us to be decisive and to move into action. We can move past our guilt, past our doubt, past our troubles, and accept God's mercy and grace and restore our broken relationship with him and live lives according. The Bible clearly tells us Jesus is the only way. Jesus himself calls to us when he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. We can't earn forgiveness of our sins and restore a relationship with God on our own or by trying to be good or doing these works or those works. If we could, Jesus wouldn't have had to come and die on the cross for us. Not one of us knows with any certainty when our time here will be over. Now is the time to embrace God's love for us. To be in a restored relationship with God, we must acknowledge that we sin and need to be forgiven. We need to trust in and profess Jesus Christ as Lord, that he paid for our sins on the cross and was raised from the dead according to Scripture. We need to turn from our worldly, sinful ways and embrace his holy and pure ways. Would you like to receive him today, right now? You can. There's no need to wait. We are to come as we are. Jesus knows you and loves you. He's knocking on the door of your heart right now. Will you let him in? Will you restore your relationship with God through faith in his son, Christ Jesus? I'm going to offer a prayer that I do every week. If you've never invited Jesus into your heart as your Lord and Savior, I just can't say strongly enough how important this is. This is the biggest, most important decision you can ever make um, in, in this life. And if you'd like to do that right now, I invite you to pray along with me. You may have already said this prayer in the past, but just know that you've fallen 
out of alignment, sort of just need to get recalibrated. You want to just renew your commitment and, and, and get closer to Jesus. Well, you're very welcome to say this prayer along with me. And, and so you can say this out loud. You can say it quietly. You can say it silently. Jesus hears you. He knows your heart. So I invite you to pray along with me. Dear Lord God, I confess I am a sinner and I need forgiveness of my sins. Jesus, I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. Jesus, I believe you rose from the dead according to Scripture. Jesus, right now, I invite you into my heart, into my life, to be my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, please forgive me of my sins. Jesus, help me to turn from my sinly ways, my worldly ways. Jesus, help me to turn towards your ways, your holy ways, your pure ways. Jesus, lead me as is your will. Jesus, thank you so much for loving me. In your precious name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. So that concludes our passage for today, our study of, uh, of Joshua 8. It's a terrific book of, uh, of, or, or chapter of victory and the importance of, of following Lord's commands and, and his will, seeking his will and following his directions in life. If you said this prayer along with me today for the first time, please reach out to us here at the ministry. We want to know. We want to help try to get materials into your hand so that we can assist you in your walk as, as, as we might be able to. If you said this for a second, third, hundredth time, doesn't matter. Please let us know that as well. We want to help you. We're, we are here to, to help all who, who who ask, who, who seek help. And if you uh, didn't, you know, I just pray that the, the, the spirit will, will soften your heart, will open your eyes, will open your ears. This again, this is just, there's no more important thing that we ever do in this life, but to receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior. As I often say, try to remember by the end of the message here, if you like this message today, please hit that like button, hit that share button. These messages go out literally to all points of the world. The Lord's word never returns, you know, empty void. And so you can play a role too. To, to just get this message pushed forward and forward. We have no idea who's going to hear it, when they're going to hear it, the impact it might have on someone you love, on someone you don't know at all. And so these are all just wonderful, wonderful ways that we can choose to serve the Lord as we can by witnessing for him, just getting his word out and letting the spirit do what the spirit does. So until next time, be well, be safe, stay strong in the faith. Blessings.